Good evening. The uh, Senate Judiciary yeah. Committee will come back to order following our recess from this afternoon's hearing. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, this is a continuation of our hearing uh, relating to the reduction of gun violence in Minnesota. And this evening, the portion of our hearing will consist of uh, taking public input, public testimony uh, relating to any of the proposals that are on the committee's agenda, either from this afternoon's hearing where certain bills were presented and were laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, um, or tomorrow's agenda, uh, which will also be the same procedure. Each person here will be given two and a half minutes to testify. And that may not seem like much time, uh, but uh, please understand that we have a lot of people want to uh, share their views, and uh, we are going to be uh, strictly adhering to that time limit so we can make sure everyone who has made the trip here to the Capitol to, uh, to testify has that opportunity to do so. Uh, you will be asked to direct your testimony to a specific bill that was presented either at the noon hearing today or will be presented at the noon hearing tomorrow. Um, I, I will simply say you don't have to identify a bill by... Uh, Senate file number, but if you could at least in your testimony specify which policy proposal uh, you're addressing, if you have one in particular that you'd like to, us to consider your input on. Uh, there will be no testimony allowed regarding any proposals to ban assault weapons or to ban high capacity magazine clips. Uh, those policy proposals are off the table, and so we're not going to be taking public testimony on those either. They are not before this committee. Uh, for those of you who have not testified before a, a legislative committee before, I'll just give you some ideas on the, the, the proper protocol. Uh, when you uh, get to the table, we'll ask you to uh, identify your name. All of the proceedings are recorded uh, for uh, the public record. Uh, so we'll ask you to state your name and then um, please address your comments uh, through me as the chairman of the committee. You don't have to look at me the whole time. Um, but at least when you make your initial remarks, uh, it should be uh, through me. Um, and uh, if we have a member that wants to ask you a direct question, uh, then the way to direct your answer is through the chair. So you say, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator so-and-so, and then you can respond with your answer. Although I'm anticipating um, most of this hearing will simply be us listening to what you have to say. Um, and there won't be much in the way of question and answer from the committee. A clapping or other disruptive behavior will not be allowed. Uh, we want to assure that everyone is, is accorded the proper respect and decorum when they are testifying so that they can be heard and their voice will be meaningful and not silenced by any kind of a, a public reaction within the room that may disagree with them or if it agrees with them, they have any kind of an impact on others who are also considering testifying. Um, if the testimony is halted because of excessive noise, we will not be able to get to as many names on the list. And not only clapping or other disruptive behavior, but any behavior that we perceive to be um, offensive or particularly disrespectful to the message or the person that is making, giving the testimony, uh, we will ask you to stop and if it happens again, we will ask the Sergeant at Arms to, uh, to remove you from this hearing room. I will read three names off of the list. Um, I have the list divided between those who, generally speaking, have indicated that they support uh, measures uh, similar to the proposals that are being considered by the committee and those who have indicated they generally oppose those measures. Uh, we're going to go three, four, and three against in that order. Um, so when I read off the list of names, I'll ask the first three to come up to the table. And then I, at that time, we'll also read the next three so you can be prepared. That way, we should be able to move most efficiently. Uh, we will uh, go as, as long as we need to to finish the names of the people that have signed up for testimony and, uh, or until 9.30 p.m., um, I'm anticipating that we'll be able to get everyone in before 9.30 as long as we stick to our respective time limits. And when you get to the table, there is a clipboard that has a sign-in sheet. I know all of you did already sign in when you received your tickets, but some of the names were not legible or legible enough for the public record. 
So we'll ask you to again sign legibly and carefully on the clipboard. We don't need your addresses again, just your name. Uh, so um, I'm going to be cutting people off at two minutes and 30 seconds, and I'll do my best to give you some informal, nonverbal cues that your time is, is coming close to an end. Um, and uh, my, my assistant here will be keeping a time so that uh, I can be fair to everyone. So, Senator Limmer, you want to keep time? No. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, if there are no uh, questions from the committee about how we intend to proceed, then why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, the, uh, the first three uh, witnesses will be, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce any names, and, um, uh, and sometime, I'm gonna blame it all on the legibility of, of how, you, how you signed it. Uh, Bill Karasi, Linda Windsor, and Joan Peterson, please come on forward to the witness table and have a seat, and when they are done, uh, we will hear from Naomi Koning or Kenning, uh, Michael Gerster, and Stephen Noxow. So, welcome to the committee. Uh, and uh, Bill, is, did I pronounce it correctly? Kraus. Oh, I was way off. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Kraus, go ahead and uh, proceed with your testimony. Uh, hello. Thank you for letting me testify. My name is Bill Cross of Plymouth, Minnesota, District Number 46. I'm a gun owner. I'm a gun owner that believes in rational, common sense gun laws. I don't live in fear that someone will get me, including my government. I'm not paranoid. The present NRA does not represent me, not since the Cincinnati Revolt of 1977 when they made a drastic change in leadership that still shows to this day. I own six guns. Two I purchased at a gun store. Three I received from an uncle after leaving them in an empty house after he went into a nursing home. And one, a Model 29, 44 Magnum, that I purchased from a roommate of mine. He was going to pawn his guns, but I purchased that one, and another person purchased the other one. Cash and carry. No paperwork, nothing. I need a background check to volunteer at my kid's school. You need a background check for many jobs you may apply for. My family hosts exchange students. Everyone that lives in my house needs a background check to host a student. Everyone, even a juvenile. But now the NRA leadership has flip-flopped from wanting a universal background check to not wanting a universal background checks. Background checks keep guns out of the hands of people that should not have them. It may not stop everyone, but it will help greatly. We need to improve the irresponsible, I repeat, irresponsible way we handle guns in this hopefully civilized society. That is what we are striving for, isn't it? A civilized society. There's always room for improvement. Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Windsor. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, Mr. Chair, my name is Linda Windsor. I'm here to support Senate File 458 that addresses background checks for gun sales in Minnesota. I'm married and the mother of three grown sons. I live in St. Paul and I vacation in outstate Minnesota. I support SF Senate File 458 because it will help to reduce gun violence in our communities, urban and rural alike. Background checks will help to decrease the number of guns that fall into the wrong hands, which means less gun violence in our communities, including assault, murder, and suicide. As a mother, I cannot imagine the horror of losing a child to gun violence. As a citizen, I cannot imagine not working to reduce gun violence in our state and country. As an elected official, I hope you'll find the political will and courage to pass Senate File 458 so there can be a vote on that. Most Minnesotans support background checks. Most Americans support background checks. Enough is enough. Now is the time for common sense gun violence prevention. And I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Windsor. Uh, Ms. Peterson. Senator Latz, members of the committee, 
My name is Joan Peterson. I'm on the board of Protect Minnesota. I'm on the board of the National Brady Campaign. I'm on the board of Domestic Abuse Intervention Programs, nationally and internationally known program located in Duluth, which is where I came from today, and I want everyone to know I came here at my own expense. I came here because I want to tell you a story. I've come here before. I've told you this story many times before, maybe not you on this committee individually, but to the legislature. 20 years ago, my sister Barbara Lund was shot to death in a domestic shooting. I have been coming here for many years to ask this legislature to please pass common sense gun legislation, but nothing has happened. Nothing has been done. I submit to you that since December 14th, the paradigm, there has been a paradigm shift in this country. Nothing is the same. When 20 little children, the age of my grandchildren, were massacred, the country said, enough is enough. I have come here today to ask you to please support universal background checks. Since 1214, almost 2,000 Americans have lost their lives to gunshot wounds. I would like to address the idea that, that came up this afternoon that there, were, there is no private sale um, loophole. I know for a fact that there is. Um, I have worked with someone who has gone to a gun show and bought several weapons and said, I cannot pass a background check, and the seller allowed him to take the gun out, no questions asked. There are many hidden camera videos, among them Colin Goddard, a young man who was shot four times at Virginia Tech, has gone around to gun shows all over the country, including one in Minnesota. He specifically asked or said that he could not pass a background check. The guns were, give, were sold to him with no questions asked. There is a private sale loophole. Polling data in Minnesota and nationally has said for years and years that the public wants universal background checks. A 2006 University of Minnesota poll showed 82% of Minnesotans want universal background checks. Of late, after the Sandy Hook shooting, 92% of Americans have said they want background checks. I am asking you at long last, and the public is telling you at long last, to do the right thing. You must remember that if you don't, there will be more and more victims. Being a victim is not something that those of us who are in that category enjoy. It's not a club that we like belonging to. Ms. Peterson, your time is up. Thank you. I thank you for your testimony. Uh, Naomi Koning or Kenning, Michael Gerster, and Stephen Noxaw, please come on forward. And uh, following those three, uh, Mary Streifer, Tom Goldstein, and Heather Martins, please be ready to come forward. <coughs> Uh, Ms. Uh, Koning, did I pronounce that correctly? Koenig. Koenig. K I was completely off. I'm sorry. That's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> Go ahead and proceed with your testimony, ma'am. All right. Thank you for your time. I'd like to talk today on uh, SF-458, SF-557. I'm a mother. I'm a wife to a disabled veteran. I'm an ER nurse and a paramedic. I have seen gun violence working as a paramedic in North Minneapolis. I fought to save children shot by criminals. I have also helped thousands with mental illness, witnessed people coming into the ER for help instead of harming themselves. <coughs> SF-557 will prevent law-abiding citizens from seeking the needed help. Suicide rates will increase and no lives will be saved. <coughs> I know this because mental health patients already are stigmatized and have a difficulty seeking treatment. Now you propose taking away their constitutional rights without due process. As a healthcare professional, I do not support the use of health information for legislative or law enforcement use. I'd like to share a personal story. Last October, I finished shopping with my kids in a, at an organic co-op, went out to put my kids in the car. As I was buckling my son in his car seat, a man came out of nowhere put his hands on my little girl and attempted to take her. Excuse me. Before I knew what was happening, he had his hands on her and was trying to take off with her. I screamed and I yelled and I tried to get him to stop and I knew that I was no match for him, except I have a permit to carry. I pulled 
my legally permitted gun, not a shot was fired. The police were called and this two-time con convicted child sex offender was arrested again. He is a criminal. I am not. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, if I hear one more outburst, you will be removed from this committee. Uh, Sergeant. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry, but your two and a half minutes are up. Um, I, because he interrupted, I don't get uh, to finish. No, your two and a half minutes are up. <laughs> Be, at the time that he interrupted you, I'm sorry. I'm going to assign the same, apply the same rule to everyone You're who's testifying. So. Thank you. All right. Um, Have you got more to say? I, I do. So, uh, Michael ahead, uh, no. Gerster. Can she go ahead? Would you like to yield and, your time to her? Sir, would you like I'll to give yield my time, your time to her? To... I think her, her testimony is very important. That's it. Thank you. Perfectly appropriate. Go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> Guns save lives. God knows what that criminal would have done to my little girl. Once he got her alone, I truly believe that the only thing that will stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. I would like to close with thoughts on Senate floor 458. As an ER nurse, I recently had the privilege to care for a 96-year-old woman that grew up in Germany. Her father was a law enforcement officer. The time came to register guns and classes of citizens. He was told to stand aside and his family would be safe. Years went by, she said, and then they came to take her family away. She saw her father gunned down in front of her, her mother sent to a concentration camp. I am not one of those people that is paranoid that the government is coming to take my guns. But when that woman looked at me and said, with fear and tears in her eyes, Never give up your freedoms for a false sense of security. It made me stop and think. Legislating my rights away under SF 458 will not protect anyone except for criminals. Criminals will never register. Criminals will never pay the unconstitutional transfer fees or the unconstitutional registry fees. I am not a sex offender and I will not be part of any kind of unconstitutional registry. Thank you for your time. All right, uh, and uh, sir, you got about 15 seconds remaining, and <laughs> no. if you'd like to say anything, go ahead. I, uh, I don't mean okay. to sound harsh, uh, but I'm Michael Gerster. Uh, I represent the Oakdale Gun Club, uh, 1,500 members strong. Uh, we generally oppose most of the bills. Uh, we are not going to oppose 235. Uh, I believe that's your bill, Senator, and uh, but. Most of the other ones, we are in opposition. It's, uh, it's an imposition uh, to, you know, on the 458 to a lot of law-abiding citizens. I, I've used my 15 seconds, I'm sure. Thank you, sir. And, and lest anyone think I'm harsh, everyone was told ahead of time that they were going to be given two and a half minutes. And uh, I'm sorry, that's, but we're just going to have to try to be as strict as we can here. So thank you. Uh, sir, go ahead. What is your name, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Noixon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. I'm here today to speak in op opposition to SF 458. Uh, sir, my concerns, I guess, about universal background checks is that they would be used primarily and pr maybe only by law-abiding citizens. By the very definition of the word criminal, criminals do not follow the law and I can't imagine them yielding to background checks. Uh, We've tried gun control before in this country. We all know what the 90s were like and how ineffective it was. I think it's important to learn from the past. I don't see it working, so I'm in opposition to this bill. Uh, background checks, you know, also form a record of purchase and approval that we cannot guarantee will ever be removed from a government bank. And most citizens don't want that. I certainly don't. Um, 
Also, too, citizens' rights to purchase arms ought never be subject to approval uh, <coughs> from such an agency. Uh, I get real frightened when people tamper with the Constitution. This is serious business. Once you start changing the Constitution, it can be a very slippery slope that all of us pay a big price for later. So I ask you respectfully to reject SF 458. Uh, I thank you all very much for your time and wish you a good evening. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Chair, thank you, uh, may Senator I ask a Orman? brief question? Um, to the testifier in the middle, I heard your testimony. Yeah. Can you just remind me of your name again? And then you, you spoke to two bills, and I wanted to make sure I understood which bills you were testifying against. It's Naomi Koenig. Thank you. Um, I spoke to uh, 458 and 557. Mr. Chair, that 557, I'm just trying to figure out what that bill was, which one that is. It's 557. Uh, Senator Ortman, uh, that's a, a bill authored by Senator Cohen will be heard tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Relating to mental health screen. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you. Uh, next up, Mary Stroyfer, Tom Goldstein, and Heather Martins. And following them will be William Tigner, Corey Berkmeyer, and Arthur Bork. Ms. Stryfer. Thank you, Senator Latz. Um, this afternoon I testified and told the story of uh, my daughter being uh, kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Uh, following my testimony, a gentleman from, I believe, Cambridge um, mentioned that the, uh, it was the men who were doing the raping and the killing and the kidnapping and not the gun. And I just thought you might be interested in hearing the rest of the story. Um, after our daughter was murdered, my husband and I participated in a victim offender restorative justice program where we met with the two offenders who are currently serving life sentences um, in prison, and we met with them. And in one of our conversations with one of the gentlemen, I asked him, I said, would you have done this if you hadn't had the gun? And he said, no way, we never would have even approached her. And I tell you this story because I have come to believe that um, a lot of crime happens because it's a power issue. And the guns gave these two particular men power, a feeling of power that they didn't have otherwise. Now I'm not saying this is true of everybody because I don't believe it's true of everybody, but it is true for some people. And, and it gives them power to do things that they wouldn't normally do under other circumstances if they did not have a gun available. Now how you weed out those people with background checks is probably pretty impossible, but I just wanted to tell you the rest of the story. that. The gun does make a difference, and yes, it does take somebody to pull the trigger, but the gun does make a difference. Thank you. Mr. Goldstein. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Tom Goldstein, and I'm a resident of St. Paul working with the group's Jewish Community Action and Protect Minnesota. In August 1985, during my third year of law school, my seatmate was shot in the back of his head as he was unlocking his vehicle to go home. Miraculously, he survived his injuries, but another man, an employee of Control Data who had come to the U.S. from Great Britain, was killed by the same assailant and left behind a wife and two young daughters. When I served on the school board in St. Paul, I was always worried that an incident like what had happened in Columbine or Red Lake or so many other places would be visited upon one of our schools. It seemed inevitable, given the firepower that is on our streets and in our homes, even though I believe the district had excellent protocols in place and deployed our community resource officers in a very strategic manner. So while I was horrified by what happened in Newtown, Connecticut just two months ago, I was not surprised. How can we as a nation be surprised or shocked when we have done so little to curb the violence in our cities or the easy access to weapons and ammunition with increasing lethality? 
When I hear the defenders of the Second Amendment speaking passionately about the rights of law-abiding citizens, my response is, what about the rights of law-abiding victims? Don't we have the right to expect our elected officials to do everything in their power to protect us in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and in our schools? So often when we try to have a discussion about doing something to reduce gun violence in this country, we get caught up in all sorts of technical details and minutia that we lose sight of the victims. Whether it's my former law school classmate, somebody you know, or the children at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown. These individuals are not technicalities or statistics, but human faces that we easily forget when we focus on ideology rather than safety. That's how we've come to view guns as merely tools rather than for the firepower they can deliver. Here's how Veronica Posner, the mother of Noah, a little boy who died in the Sandy Hook tragedy, described the impact of those tools. We all saw how beautiful he was. He had thick, shiny hair, beautiful long eyelashes that rested on his cheeks. He looked like he was sleeping, but the reality of it was under the cloth he had covering his mouth, there was no mouth left. His jaw was blown away. I just want people to know the ugliness of it so we don't talk about it abstractly, like these little angels just went to heaven. No. They were butchered, they were brutalized, and that is what haunts me at night. Universal background checks and closing the gun show loophole are an important first step, but they are not enough. Please don't forget the faces of the victims. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Good evening. Thank you for having me this Can evening. you pull the microphone closer to so you, please? Closer. Okay. okay. My name is Heather Martens. I'm Executive Director of Protect Minnesota. Um, there are a number of things that we'll be addressing tomorrow as part of bill testimony. Tonight I would like to bring to this committee uh, a few voices that are uh, not going to be here because um, they are students of history in Germany who I uh, have told about the use of German history to, um, to push a political agenda in the United States and I would like to to read to you some of their uh, discussion of what the actual history is. Um, after World War II, the gun laws uh, in West Germany were based on the 1928 Weimar Law until the passage of the 1968 Federal Weapons Law. The Nazis did not change gun laws until March 1938. First it applied, there was registration already in effect in 1938 before the Nazis even got into power. Um, the minimum age for the acquisition of firearms after the Nazis took control was lowered from 20 to 18 years. It eliminated requirements such as gun permits for individuals with a hunting permit, government officials, and Nazi party members. The validity of gun permits was increased from one to three years. Secondly, it specifically prohibited Jews from manufacturing guns but not from obtaining gun permits or owning guns. It denied... Um, and at that point, you may recall that guns were used by members of the Nazi party to intimidate duly elected democratic officials in the Weimar Republic. Um, they go on to say um, that the use of German history is uh, a misuse for a political gain and uh, that the that gun regulation, the argument that gun regulation threatens the liberties of ordinary citizens um, is incorrect. Most European countries have very strict of gun policies, similar to those of the Federal Republic of Germany today. All of these countries are stable, liberal, and open democracies. On the other hand, totalitarian, totalitarian states in other parts of the world also impose strict gun laws. We conclude there is no relationship between the scope of gun regulation and the level of personal liberty. The analysis of gun policies is a poor way to assess the nature of a political liberty in any given country. Ms. Martin, your time was up. I'm sorry. Okay. That from Clemens Brandt and uh, Bajimir Osgore. Thank you. Right, next up, William uh, Tigner, Corey Burkmeyer, and Arthur Bork. And following them will be Alex Levine, Kathleen, is it Barchus or Simmons, and Jean Martin. Uh, Mr. Tigner. Mr. Chairman, my name is Bill Tigner. Um, I'm not a member of any organization or political party. I do my own research, and I'm just here to represent uh, Minnesotans. Uh, in 2010, in Brooklyn Center, a gentleman by the name of Timberlake was engaged 
in the private sale of firearms, which would have been affected by Senate File 458. Mr. Timberlake, however, was a felon and he was arrested. Um, when he was arrested, there were two other uh, firearms in the car besides the one he had tucked in his belt. They were all loaded. There was a four-year-old child in the car and there were 12 and a half grams of marijuana hidden underneath that child. In 2011, Mr. Timberlake was one of 44 uh, people uh, charged as felons in possession of a firearm. Uh, he, is, uh, he was convicted in federal court and is serving an 80-month sentence. But that's not really the story. The story is that <clears throat> Mr. Timberlake was first charged with a felony in the year 2000. And since then, he was arrested seven times before this offense as a felon in possession of a firearm. Uh, he was prosecuted twice in Hennepin County, once in Ramsey County, and then I believe a third time in Hennepin County in a 10-year period before he was finally charged in federal court and sent to prison. And I submit to you that whatever law you pass, including this one, will not stop the Mr. Timberlakes who live in the Twin Cities community. Uh, they're criminals and they won't follow these laws. Uh, he didn't then, and in seven years when he's out, if he goes back into business selling handguns in Minneapolis, he won't follow them uh, then either. A couple of the things I'd like to add. Uh, the, the point of these laws is to decrease firearm violence in the state of Minnesota. This is a Minnesota law. According to the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, in 2011, there were 78 criminal homicides in Minnesota with 5,400,000 residents in the state. Uh, that gives us uh, a murder rate of about one per 100,000 uh, residents. That rate is lower than Canada. It's the same as Great Britain. It's a little higher than Germany. Um, I propose that we live in one of the safest places in the world right now. And it makes me wonder why we need more gun laws here in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, um, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Corey Berkemeyer. I live, I'm a resident of Plymouth, Minnesota. Others have and will continue to point out all of the things that are wrong with Senate File 458, whether it's criminalizing and depriving citizens seeking mental health uh, treatment of a constitutional right without due process, creating a de facto gun registry by banning private transfers of firearms, or charging fees to exercise a constitutional right. One point that I want to address is this notion that we are obligated to do something to save just one life. Using this logic, if you could save just one fetus, would you ban abortion? We could come up with an endless stream of absurdities using this rhetoric. The only thing we would be able to agree on at the end of that discussion is that the one more life criterion is a recipe for bad legislation. There's too much at stake here to employ such a vapid argument. We are told over and over that, we get, that if we give up just a little bit of liberty, just a little bit, that the all-powerful state will make us safe. Over time, these little bits add up. And it gets to a point where responsible citizens who take accountability for their liberty have to say enough is enough, and we've reached that point. Frankly, I find it appalling and outrageous that some legislators are willing to sacrifice my liberty so that they can posture politically and proclaim that they did something about gun violence. This bill is just one more step in the endless march to destroy the concepts of personal liberty and accountability that made the United States great. I ask you to focus on efforts that will actually make a difference. Enforce current laws, prosecute violent, violent criminals, and keep them incarcerated. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are intended to protect us from government. I only hope that they do so in this case. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Bork. Senator Latz. Um, my name is Art Bork. I'm from Cambridge, Minnesota. and. Um, here to talk about um, the uh, universal uh, background checks thing. I do have a permit to carry. I had to pass a background check for that. Every firearm I have ever purchased, I have had to pass a federal background check to purchase them. Uh, in my mind, that is a universal background check already. 
So, you know, it's tacking on the fees and everything doesn't make any sense. And in my, in my case personally, it makes very little sense. And it would, it would be a severe burden to me personally, and I know it would be a burden to others, because of our income. Um, I'm pretty sure that all of you would be able to afford it very easily. <laughs> Tacking on a $25 registration fee, $25 background check fee, having to go through an FFL for every single transfer, purchase, whatever, it would basically bankrupt a lot of people. It turns a right into a privilege. Thank you, sir. Chair, do I have, can uh, I ask a question? Senator Lummer. Uh, Mr. Tigner, is, it, is that what it was? Mr. Tigner? Yes, sir. Uh, you had made mention of a, an offender, <coughs> a criminal yes. history of an offender by the name of Timberlake. That's correct, sir. Uh, in your study of his, of his criminal history, did you, were you made aware of any type of plea bargains that would have gotten rid of the gun charge in his history of using a gun? Uh, according to the U.S. Attorney in Minneapolis, he did uh, plea down from a gun charge in a couple of his arrests. He was ar actually arrested seven times as a felon in possession of a firearm. And one of his convictions was overturned because uh, the stop was deemed uh, inappropriate or they didn't have just cause for the stop to arrest him. Um, and if the uh, committee would like, I have a copy here uh, that pretty much describes the uh, chain of events that led to his 80-month sentence in federal court. Sir. Mr. Thank Tigner, if you'd like to submit that, we'll make it a part of the public record. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Senator Lemmer. Uh, Mr. Chair, the reason I ask that question is that this is, I just took a stab at it, but this is common. That's what I'm when, told. When gun charges are plea bargained away, in order for a fast prosecution. Now, sometimes it's not just a fast prosecution. Sometimes it's a prosecutor that may not have an entire prosecution all wrapped up and it's a slam dunk case and they make a plea bargain and they at least get the threat off the streets and get them in a cell. Uh, but I think our committee, as we look at this type of issue, we probably should look at that too, Mr. Chair, sometime in the, in the next few weeks and examine the uh, prospect that are we, in fact, as a government, allowing so many plea bargains that we're, we're not having gun charges anymore. We keep hearing that we have lots of gun laws, but are we really enforcing them? Um, Senator? Yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. According to the FBI website, um, Mr. Timberlake was convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm in Hennepin County twice in 2005, in Ramsey County in 2006, in Anoka County in 2009, and he was also charged with another felony offense in 2000 that, was, uh, that occurred just a few months after his first felony conviction. Thank you, Mr. Tigner. I should just note that we start getting into trying to legislate over prosecutorial discretion, and we really start down a very slippery slope. Um, but that's a topic for another day, I think. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair. Who said that? Uh, Senator Dietzer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I don't, I don't um, disagree with Senator Limmer that um, I don't know if it's something that we can look at and have um, authority over, but I would also, um, also look at, if we do look at this, um, I don't know how much of it is prosecutorial, some of it's discretion, but some of it may be staffing issues and funding issues. And they have to pick and choose, and I believe they, you know, most county attorney's office, if you ask them, are they, you know, they could always use more prosecutors. So I think that, you know, you can always use more law enforcement. So there's two sides to it, too. Uh, thank you. Next up, uh, Alex Levine, uh, Kathleen uh, Barchus Simmons, and Jean Martin, and following them, Samuel Wiley, Greg Dahlstrom, and Curtis Anderson. Mr. Levine. Thank you, Chairman. Sir, go uh, ahead. My name is Alex Levine, and I wanted to talk a bit about background checks. I believe we can enact gun laws which both protect people's Second Amendment right and provide a general level of safety to the public. All rights have limits, and the Second Amendment is no different. During these hearings, I haven't heard 
that the NIC system doesn't work. I have heard that it needs to be improved, that more information needs to be shared for the program to be more effective. If that system works, why wouldn't we want to expand it to further protect the future victims of gun violence? Criminals will always figure out a way to get their hands on a gun if they try hard enough, but this is not a reason just to shrug our shoulders. We are a society ruled by law, and even though we know that those, even though we know that there are the, those who will break them. The McDonald and Heller cases should be a comfort to those worried about having their guns confiscated. We have laws on the books which haven't led to the total ban of all guns, and there has to be an effort to address the never-ending tragedies that we deal with in our communities. This is not about law-abiding citizens, but about keeping the guns from people who have lost the right to purchase one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Barchus Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kathleen Barchus Simons. This is my first time coming to legislative hearings. I'm coming because the gun violence and the lethality of guns in our streets is escalating. We have to do something. Now that my son is grown and on his own, I, I can feel my focus turning from raising him to what kind of world are we living, leaving for him? and his kids, hopefully my grandkids, and his grandkids. I am deeply concerned about this escalation of, of gun violence in the streets and in the lethality of the guns on our streets. We must act. I, I grew up in a hunting family. My son is in the military. He's an avid hunter. I'm a strong believer in Second Amendment rights. And I'm also a strong believer in the public's right to safety. So we must find a solution. As I've stood in the lines waiting to get into the hearings today and a couple weeks ago, I've had plenty of opportunity to hear about gun owners' views and concerns. And I appreciate the several people who have so graciously offered to help me understand those perspectives. I have learned a lot. One common theme is people like their guns, they like their shooting, they like their hunting, they like their collecting. And people don't like the government interfering with their, with their rights. I acknowledge those concerns. Universal background checks, though, can do a lot in reducing gun violence. It's not the complete answer, but it's an important part of it. So as a mom, and hopefully as a grandmom, I thank the committee for having these hearings, and I hope you'll pass this universal background check bill for my kid, my kids' kids, and your kids. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Martin? <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Gene Martin, and I, again, pastor joint heirs with Christ Faith International Church in North Minneapolis, and I've had the privilege of pastoring uh, people all across the Twin City area. Our church currently has many members that are residents of St. Paul. We've had people to come as far as Hastings, uh, members to come from uh, Minnetonka, right into the inner city of North Minneapolis. But I'm here to, to speak up on, for this bill because it's very important to our inner city, our community, that as much as can be done to, to provide safe streets for our children, it would be done. And one of the things that's, that's terrifying our community are, are guns that's being purchased and being brought into the city and illegally sold on our streets. And some of those weapons have been bought legally, but they've not been bought legally from like a gun store and they're coming and they're coming into our cities and they're creating havoc. I grew up in Minneapolis. I've been a resident of Minneapolis for over 50 years and uh, quite a few years over 50. And uh, I had the privilege of playing on the streets. My son, my youngest son, who's 20, 20 years old, I kept him in the house because of the fear of him going out being shot. And that's the whole thing. We have a city of fear because of the, there's so many guns 
that's being brought into our community and being sold to these children, being put into the hands of children. And many of them are not children, but once they pull that trigger, they are criminals. And there are many that are not involved in anything, but when something happens, the illusion is because they're from the inner city that they are criminals. And that is certainly not the case. So I'm just here to ask that you would uphold this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. All right, uh, Samuel Wiley, Greg Dahlstrom, and Curtis Anderson. And after them will be Leroy Duncan, Ann Jones, and Sammy Rachamim or Shireen Rachamim. Mr. Wiley. Hello, I'm Samuel Wiley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee for listening to me. I'm a new resident of Minnesota. I live in Minneapolis. Uh, I moved from Oregon, where I have eight years of law enforcement and security experience to include being a federal police officer. I also have extensive experience in training in the use of firearms to military, law enforcement, and civilians. I have responded to shots fired calls I have seen people who have been shot. I have had friends who have been bystanders in shootings, and even one that was a bystander in a school shooting. I am in opposition to Senate Bill 458 for universal background checks because I feel it may cost individuals lives. Uh, the reason behind that is there can be wrong denials due to similar names, identifiable uh, uh, descriptions, uh, the system could be down, and it's not uncommon for a government bureaucratic system to have problems. Um, I have taught several women and men who have legitimate fears for their life and who needed an immediate purchase of a handgun, rifle, shotgun. I believe if you instituted the uh, Senate Bill 458, um, it may prevent them from getting it if there was a wrongful denial. I, I respectfully request that you look into this and see how accurate the system would be and also would you be willing to stake one person's life on a wrongful denial. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Uh, Mr. Dahlstrom. My name is Greg Dahlstrom from Lakeville, Minnesota. Uh, in the earlier session, I submitted a outline of the speech I'm gonna be talking from here now. It includes citations to all of the stats and figures. Uh, the Senate bill SF-458 requiring universal background checks is anything but universal. This bill will have no universal effect. It will only add to the disenfranchisement of the underclass similar to a poll tax. The most popular Metro gun store charges a transfer fee of $50 regardless of the firearms value. This additional fee will result in a disparate impact on the poor as they are the most likely to be a victim of violent crime. Additionally, this committee has been concerned with mental health. Many adults battle with a temporary case of depression or other mental illness at some point in their life. This bill would prevent them from being able to easily transfer their firearms to a family member or a lifelong friend for safekeeping. This bill will have no universal application. This bill can only be meaningful in reducing crime if the criminals cooperate. No rational person can imagine a drug dealer or murderer walking into a gun store asking for a background check and paying for the privilege to have it done. Most crime guns are sourced from street dealers, thefts, which account for 26 to 32 percent of street guns, and straw purchases, which account to 30 to 47 percent. This bill will have no effect on at least 80 percent of all gun crime. What do the criminals have to say about this universal background check? Tiny, a 17-year-old North Minneapolis gang member, most likely uh, from Re Reverend or Pastor Martin's community, was recently interviewed and he had this to say. The background check don't apply to us. That's not how it works. Guns are circulated by different people from different gangs. I can get a gun from someone in Brooklyn Park or Cedar Riverside. Tiny and his gun supplier will not be going into a gun shop for a background check. This bill does not have universal support. Gun controllers would have you believe that it has 80 to 90% approval for this bill. 
As I told you earlier today, this is not true. I'm disappointed that the committee here today and some of the authors have chosen to take this time to use politics instead of making our children safer in schools. Sandy Hook showed us that our children are not safe from criminals or any bad guy. There are things that can be done. Look around this room and you will see exit signs, fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems. If we put just a fraction of that effort into protecting our children and teachers from, from attacks, many lives could be saved. The response to a school shooter is to lock the classroom doors and hide. Simply reinforcing the doors, windows, and walls with bulletproof material of classroom would actually save some lives. We don't need to turn our schools into prisons for them to be safer from shooters, just as we didn't need to turn them into fire stations to be safe from fire. Mr. Dahlstrom, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Anderson. Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chair, and uh, members of the committee. I was up here earlier, I got a little frazzled. Um, it's the first time I ever spoke in front of a committee, and you said I had one minute, so I didn't know how to condense everything. Um, you have two and a half minutes this time. Well, two minutes and 10 seconds now. <laughs> Um, my name is Curtis Anderson. I'm 26 years old and I've lived, all he lived here all my life, aside from a year in Florida and a year in Iraq and Kuwait. I am not an elected representative, <clears throat> I am not a lawyer, and I am definitely not a scholar. I am just a guy, a resident of this state, that came to express how I feel about these bills being passed, specifically Senate File 458. I am Minnesota. You are Minnesota. We are all Minnesota. We all want to protect Minnesota, but the definition of the word protect has, is vastly different between gun rights advocates and gun control advocates. According to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, Minnesota has the fifth least gun murders at 1.4 per 100,000. We are the eighth least in the nation for violent crime at 221.2 per 100,000. If you look at the Uniform Crime Report and crunch the numbers, you'll find that Chicago has seven times the population of Minneapolis, and they have over 24 times more gun murders each year. One of those gun murders was committed with a rifle of any kind. 431 were with handguns, handguns that are pro prohibited in Chicago. It's an amazing thought. It's an amazing thing to think about. How could so many illegal, non-existent guns be killing so many people? The fact is that Chicago tried to tighten laws to prevent crimes that the law could not prevent. Criminals are criminals and would have no desire or inclination to abide by the laws that we, we law-abiding citizens do. If this bill has nothing to do with registration, then I'm confused as to how you would be able to enforce such a law without knowing who has what gun. I have heard testimony by many that background checks will not lead to registration. If this is truly the case, then I would ask a bill be brought forward or an amendment be made to guarantee that gun registration will never happen in the state of Minnesota. I promise you that that will never happen because that is an underlying agenda, I feel, as what you can call paranoid, if you would like, uh, citizen of Minnesota. That is all. I'll yield my time to anyone else that wants to continue speaking. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, all right, next uh, we'll have uh, Leroy Duncan, Ann Jones, and Sammy Rahamim, or Shireen Rahamim, and following them, Michael Gerard, Dick, I'm going to say Urgies or Urgies, I'm not sure, and Pat Watson. Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee, thanks. Um, so I've got a few points to make, so I'm going to hurry through this. Uh, first off, I think that we have ignored a, a huge part of this discussion that needs to be addressed, which is suicides. In Minnesota, uh, in 2007, there were over 500 suicides in this state, most of which were by gun. Right? Um, I think to not do anything and, and to not uh, require that every person uh, have their background checked before possessing deadly, a deadly weapon is essentially giving up, just like on those 500 people that we have not discussed here today. So I, I wanted to bring that up and make sure that we're thinking about those lives as well, not just the bad guys. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to address uh, Senator Limmer's uh, comment on stricter prosecution being a solution. Um, so. We can't lock up our problems. We can't do that in this state. Our prison system is already stressed. Our police force is stressed. They, they need funds to do what we're asking them to do. And if we're gonna simply say, you know what, we don't need to keep guns away from kids. Instead, let's just allow access to them and then lock them up uh, for their lives. That's just going to create 
uh, more problems in communities, more dads who aren't around, more mothers who don't have help, um, more kids that are missing dads, more kids that are locked up, more brothers and sisters that don't have their, their brothers and sisters around. That's not the kind of state I want to live in. And I know that personally because I personally uh, know a bad guy. We've been talking about bad guys here today. I don't know how many people in this room know a bad guy, but I do. My brother shot and killed a man when he was 17 years old. He was a child. On that day, I lost my hero, my personal hero. He was my, the next oldest in my family. I looked up to him. My brother made a very poor decision and, and um, you know, with four other kids in a suburb in Hopkins, Minnesota. So, um, you know, in response to Mr. Rothman's uh, arguments earlier about this is a Minneapolis problem with the suicides that are happening and just all the other gun violence that's happening outside of Minneapolis, I think we can, it's fair to say that that's, this is not a Minneapolis problem, it's a much bigger problem. Um, so on that day, I lost my hero. He's been locked up since then. I'm 30 years old now. Um, he's a great man. I talk to him every day. Uh, he regrets his decision. He owns, he owns up to his decision. He's been locked up for, you know, 18 years. Um, so here's the problem. He should have never had a gun. He was a 17-year-old child, right? Um, and, and the thing that is true in, in a lot of communities in Minneapolis right now is the fact is kids are finding it much easier to find guns than they do to find a job, than it is to find a job in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, in other parts of the city that are strapped econ economically. So what we have to think about is like, what sort, sort of options do these kids have, Mr. right, Duncan. when they're picking up a pistol? So I'll finish up. I feel like I'm getting close to my time. The unemployment rate for people of color is 25% in this state, much higher than that of their white counterparts. We have to take that into account because that's more kids on the street, more kids without economic opportunity. We have to think about that. We can't just lock our problems up. Mr. Duncan, I'm going to thank you. Okay. And the, la the very last statement. Mr. Duncan, I'm being fair to everyone in the room. Fair enough. Same amount of time. Sorry. Thank yeah, you. I'm just passionate. Time. Uh, Ms. Jones. <laughs> Um, Ann Jones from Minneapolis speaking as a citizen who has had enough. Um, Chairman Latz and members of the committee, I support SF-458 and SF-235 as a good start, necessary but n frankly not sufficient to help reduce the level of gun violence in our state. I would agree that the suggestions made today by Mike Freeman could go a long way toward tightening the current laws and consequences for criminals with weapons. Um, it seems like those who don't voluntarily submit to background checks, which has been the complaint of many uh, gun owners in this room, uh, would eventually get caught if we tighten <coughs> um, some of the, uh, the rules that are in these bills. I'm not persuaded that restricting access to certain kinds of weapons or ammunition, that adding fees or steps to a process puts an undue burden on law-abiding citizens, or that because we can't fix everything, we should do nothing. And I certainly favor enforcing current gun laws. No one wants to discourage the mentally ill from seeking treatment, but I'm confident that the bill's authors can address these concerns um, by um, refining some of the language. I grew up in rural Minnesota. I am a nurse. I am a retired military. I qualified with an M9, so I'm not unfamiliar with weapons entirely. I understand that there are persons among us who are per per properly trained, qualified, and required for their work to carry weapons. I can understand the wishes of those whose lifestyle includes hunting rifles and pistols for sport, and I concede the rights of those who um, believe they need a weapon for self-defense in their home. But I do not concede that another's rights to use their um, or own guns trumps my right to be safe and free from fear as a law-abiding citizen of this country. Background checks, along with restrictions that you've talked about on sale and transfer of weapons to others who shouldn't have them, and the consequences for aiding and abetting, redefining and tightening the definition of crimes of violence, all the things that are in these bills, um, sharing data across agencies, I applaud any and all efforts to promote public safety. Um, it seems that even the most reasonable controls around guns and ammunition in this country immediately provokes cries of self-defense and Second Amendment rights. Will rights come with responsibilities? And supporters of gun rights have so far failed to address the problems that accommodating their rights impose on the rest of us. And no, more guns are not the answer. Those of us who want a sane, civilized society are the majority, and we are adding our voices to those who've been working toward this end for, for of public safety for many years. Legislators, please do the right thing. Um, gun owners, please join with those of us who want to reduce the level of gun violence in this country and in our state and its terrible costs. Let's take the lead in Minnesota. 
Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Mr. Chair, questions? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Jones, uh, I don't know if I heard you right, but were you making reference to legitimate law-abiding gun owners as failing in their responsibility in keeping guns safe for our society? Is that what you said? Ms. Jones? I think, um, the level of gun violence in this country and uh, in our society and in Minnesota has, it speaks for itself in that um, emphasizing the rights of gun owners and they prefer to call it, they really strongly wish to call themselves law abiding citizens have failed to reduce the level of violence it is increasing. So what I'm saying is that we have to balance those rights and, and beliefs and feelings with the rights of those of us who um, strongly believe that we can, with reasonable controls on guns and ammunition. That's what I thought you said. Senator Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Duncan, uh, there's been no. So Mr. Rahamim's not here. Might I take a second of his time just to finish? No, I'm sorry. Just, okay. He's not even here to yield his time to you, I'm afraid. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank um, you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. You're welcome. Uh, Michael Girard, uh, Dick Urges, or Urges, and Pat Watson. And following them will be Vic Rosenthal, Julie Makshon, and Dina Al Sharafa. Mr. Gerard, Hello. welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman Latz. Uh, my name is Michael Gerard. I'm from Elk River. Uh, I've been a history teacher for 13 years. Uh, I have my master's degree in American history. I wrote my thesis on the Federal Crimes Act of 1791. Um, we protect, oh, and I oppose uh, the expansion of background checks as an infringement on our Second Amendment. Uh, we protect pornography and hate speech, so the First Amendment uh, is not diluted. We release criminals uh, who are likely guilty because we don't want to infringe on their constitutional rights, uh, which I agree with. Uh, um, yet we jump to limit the Second Amendment at every opportunity. Uh, I personally am willing to endure the dangers of liberty because there is no safety and dependency. Um, Patrick Henry said, guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Whenever you give up that force, you are inevitably ruined. Um, if you want to curb crime, then keep violent offenders locked up. I am not a criminal, nor are any of my friends, nor are any of my family members. Uh, I am a direct descendant of the Mayflower. My forefathers fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill and through the American Revolution. I'm also a descendant of poor Polish immigrants, um, and I have no relatives in Poland because they all perished during World War II. Uh, the rights of myself and my family are sacred, as is our private property. Um, to quote Patrick Henry, I smell a rat. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, sir. Senator Limmer. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator Cohn. Mr. Chairman, sir, just a, a, a comment. You mentioned that there are no restrictions on the First Amendment, but there are a great many restrictions on the First Amendment, whether through uh, case law, uh, in some cases statutory, and uh, just within the last, what, two or three weeks, there's a gentleman who had been um, a CIA agent, I believe, who provided the name on a limited basis. Uh, he didn't realize what had happened. I'm going to get the facts a little bit mixed up. But uh, the name showed up in, uh, uh, in some type of media source. And I think he was sentenced to five years in federal prison. Um, so there That's are, that's understandable, but in the general public discourse, uh, our First Amendment rights are considered sacred by many Americans, and I stand by my statement. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, Senator I, Cohen. I will concede that uh, when you talk about national security, uh, that might be a different situation, although some people here would argue that you know, this might be a question of national security in a different way. I just want to make the point that there are many, many uh, infringements on a pure First Amendment right. And that's true of the other uh, rights enunciated in the Bill of Rights, where there are certainly uh, various kinds of, of uh, uh, provisions that have limited the exercise of those rights. Whether that's correct or not, that does exist. Okay, I'd just like to quote George Mason, who are the militia, if it not be the people of the country? 
Well, Mr. Chairman, Senator Lemons, I'm forced, or, or Cohen, forced to mention George Mason voted against the Constitution. Right. He, was a, he was a member of the Constitutional Convention. He voted no. He was on the losing side. He was worried about this very thing. Uh, thank you. Mr. Um, Chair. Is Dick, uh, Senator Orban. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make sure that I understood your testimony, and, and I, I thought I really heard it differently than Senator Cohen. What, what I thought I heard you say was that we protect hate speech, even though we don't like hate right. speech, and we protect pornography under the First Amendment, and we accept that because we don't want to infringe upon the rights of law-abiding citizens to speak. Absolutely. And that that's a very important balance of power between citizens and the government. I thought, I thought that was what you were saying. Yes. And that you were making some analogy to the Second Amendment here that we need to protect those rights as, as well as we protect the First Amendment rights. Yes, that's and correct. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Urges or Urges? Mr. Watson. Not present. Okay. Mr. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Patrick Watson from Mendota Heights, Minnesota. Uh, I'll be addressing SF-458, the private sale transfer bill. Um, I sit before you as a citizen of Minnesota, a uh, father of two elementary age children, young children, a politically moderate liberal, and a firearm owner. Uh, I'm a volunteer with Gokra, but I'm here tonight <coughs> speaking solely as myself. I am here to speak quickly uh, about the bill that's before the committee and some of its unintended consequences that may not have been thought about. Um, if I can propose a possible scenario uh, for the committee that will resonate with, uh, with many Minnesotans. Uh, as a deer hunter, I have moved to using a Ruger model Blackhawk revolver in 44 Magnum. It holds six rounds. It is completely legal to hunt with during the Minnesota firearms deer season. Uh, based on my enthusiasm with it, it is kind of a challenge to handgun hunt uh, whitetails, um, a friend of mine asks to borrow my firearm for the last weekend of the season, which I don't hunt in my region. Of course, I know my friend, and I lend it to him for the weekend, 48 hours. Uh, amongst my friends and fellow hunters and shooters, this is not an unusual act. Um, I loan firearms to my friends all the time. They loan firearms to me. We do it quite frequently. Um, although, based on SF-458 and the fact that my Blackhawk is defined by Minnesota as a pistol, uh, my friend and I would now each have to obtain a permit to purchase or transfer or permit to carry uh, with associated fees of $25 each for a permit to purchase or transfer, um, obviously $100 for a permit to carry, and then a fee of up to $50 based on some of my fellow testifiers for a transfer at a uh, FFL dealer. Now, this is just for the simple purposes of a temporary loan for 48 hours during the hunting season. Um, if the committee can explain to me uh, and other hunters in Minnesota how this additional fee on my friend and I, this up to $100 or more fee for a simple loan of a firearm uh, during the season will accomplish the aims of the sponsors and supporters of this bill, um, and please explain to us how that will uh, prevent firearm violence that they speak of. Thank you for the time. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Uh, Senator Goodwin. Mr. Watson, if uh, your friends wanted to borrow your um, fishing pole for the weekend but didn't want to buy a license, would, wouldn't that be a fee and, and, and illegal for them to do that without a license? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Goodwin, uh, a fishing license is far, far less expensive than this. Well, it's at least $18 for for a fishing license, as you're talking about $25 here, so I don't think it's a huge amount, but this is a fishing license, a fishing pole that doesn't kill human beings or anything. So I'm just trying to compare these two things and say what's wrong with having to have a background check or whatever if you're going to carry a weapon at all, whether it's to shoot deer with or whatever you're going to do with it. Because we've talked about this here, and a number of people have already told us that, 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 that only criminals carry guns, and you might not be aware of some criminal act that you're, or some past, some past imprisonment that your friends have had. But at the same time, so you're going to give them your gun for the weekend and think that there's nothing wrong with that, even though... Nobody really knows, you don't really know their background unless you've known them since they were a kid. Um, so, so yet you think that it would be too much for them to 
have a background check and spend $25 to do that. But even with a fishing pole of yours, they couldn't do that without a license. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Senator Goodwin, I stand by my testimony. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Senator Ortman. I went to the shooting range one time, one time. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the teachers at the range let me use her gun. And I shot at the, at the clay pigeons, right? Everyone that I was with was really shocked that I hit the first one. I was pretty shocked, too. <laughs> um, but she loaned me her gun for the evening and showed me how to shoot it safely. And I was impressed with um, the power of that. It was a, a huge experience for me because I'd never really shot a gun before. Um, but our, I, you're the expert here. If I had done that under this new law, would I have had to get a background check and pay for a new um, to pay for that background check and a permit in order to shoot at the range for that evening? Mr. Watson. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Hartman, I believe that based on um, Senator Champion's revisions to the bill today that that would no longer apply since the shotgun is qualified as a long gun, which was a, another firearm that he took out. And I'll, I apologize if I'm not getting that correct, but I don't believe that since she was there with you, using it with you, that wouldn't require the transfer. I'm speaking of a friend of mine who may be hunting a different acreage somewhere 100 miles, 200 miles away from where I would be hunting or where I would be located. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ortman, current law uh, states that uh, it, it would uh, not apply to a loan between persons lawfully engaged in hunting or target shooting if the loan is intended for a period of no more than 12 hours. Mr. That's Chair? Law. Maybe council can tell us if that would be changed under Senator Champion's bill. Uh, Ms. Ortman, I have uh, Senator Champion's bill here, and there's no change to that provision. Thank you. <coughs> right, uh, thank you, Mr. Watson and Mr. Gerard. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have Vic Rosenthal, uh, Julie Makshan, and Dina Al Sharafa. And following them, Frank uh, Bifolk, Riley Johnson, and Michelle McLean. Mr. Rosenthal, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the chance to testify. Um, my name is Vic Rosenthal. I'm the executive director of Jewish Community Action, which is a social justice organization with over 800 member households. More than 10 years ago, I worked on the concealed carry legislation that was passed here. And one of the rationales given back then was that it would make our, our state safer. And concealed carry was passed in most states of the country and what we've seen instead is an increase in violence, less safe communities. And we've heard story after story of individuals like Sami Rahamim, shootings in California, in Washington, in Jewish communities. And it seems like there is a time right now for reasonable, common sense policies. Every poll that I've seen now in recent uh, weeks has said that a majority of Americans and even a majority of uh, NRA members believe that universal background checks is a reasonable approach to trying to do something in our community. Conversations that I've had with NRA members, some of the first conversations of the kind that I've ever had, have told me that some approach to universal background checks is a good idea. What we keep hearing tonight and before is that if we move in the direction of universal background check, that will lead to registration and eventually to confiscation the old slippery slope argument. Well, we've had a law on the books for as long as I can remember that requires cars to be registered, and I don't know anyone that hasn't broken a law that has had their car confiscated for them, uh, from them because of something they've done wrong. It seems to me that if we have some uh, dangerous weapons like cars that we try to put some controls on, the least we could do is do the, sa the same with guns. It seems that now is the time for reasonable action. I know that this is a really difficult job for you. Um, and we hear a lot about, you know, uh, with a lot of flaws in every bill that's been written. It seems like I want to hear people talk about if we can amend a bill, let's amend a bill. Let's not discard everything because every piece of legislation isn't perfect. Uh, as someone who's come up here for many years, we never pass anything that's perfect. Things at times need to be amended. So I really hope that this is the year 
that members of the Senate and the House and the governor can demonstrate the leadership that so many of us are hoping for and can pass this and other reasonable uh, legislation to protect gun violence from our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, Julie Makshon. I hope I pronounced it right. There's a question mark even down here, the way it's written. <laughs> Malika. Oh, boy. That was written wrong, wasn't it? I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members, my name's Julie Malika. I live in St. Louis Park and work downtown St. Paul. I am testifying today because my life has been directly affected by gun violence. My friend's husband was murdered in a senseless act of gun violence. It has been heartbreaking to watch her and her family try to recover from their indescribable loss. I ask that action is taken, that laws are enacted, including background checks, before any more people have to suffer such a loss. Please take this first step. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Al-Sharafa. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good evening. My name is Dina Al-Sharafa, and I am a student at the University of Minnesota Law School. In September, I began working for the school's human rights clinic, and there I have considered several human rights, most prominently the right to life. It is certainly the most essential <laughs> right of all human beings. And even if we agree that there are other human rights that we must guarantee, they cannot possibly be enjoyed before the right to life is fulfilled. And even if self-defense can never achieve the status of a human right, it would always be derivative of the right to life because self-defense is the protection of our right to life. So let's start there with the right to life, the right not to be killed by another person. I'm not concerned with adults who understand the power of a firearm and the responsibilities that are associated with that power. We should, however, be concerned with arming people who are unable or unwilling to differentiate between right or wrong or between reality and fantasy, such as criminals or the mentally ill. And we should utilize our government records when we can to, to curb the substantial deaths attributed to firearms in this country and in this state. So let's start by preventing these attacks on our lives so we don't have to be put in a position where we have to defend our lives. Mass shootings should not be such easy undertakings, but they are because there are no real legal barriers today between a criminal and a lethal weapon. Yesterday, I conducted a search on armslist.com, a self-described firearms marketplace, where sellers, both dealers and private parties, create listings to sell or trade firearms. I searched for firearms in the state of Minnesota and I immediately noticed that the list listings of private parties far outnumbered the listings of dealers, from 60 by dealers to over 1,000 by private sellers. Oh. Refining that search to only semi-automatic rifles or guns for sale or trade by a private seller, this site returned over 400 listings that matched my search. And any individual who searches this site will find the same uh, the same number of firearms to purchase from any number of private sellers without legal formalities. That worries me as a student, um, often on a school campus, which is often the site of, of shootings. In fact, there have been five shootings at school campuses this year alone. Ms. al I have to thank you thank for you. your testimony. Uh, next up, uh, Frank Bifolk, Riley Johnson, and Michelle McLean. And following that, uh, Dean Zimmerly, Jan Antonozzi, and Matt, I think it's Dosser. Um, I will note for the record, uh, you're going to notice uh, that uh, we, have, we will stop alternating between pros and cons because we have completed the list that had signed up beforehand uh, for pro. So the rest of those witnesses that have signed up um, are now um, opponents of of the uh, legislation that's being considered. Mr. Uh, is it Bifolk? Uh, Mr. Bifolk, that is correct. Uh, congratulations. You're in a very large rare You're team. On, yeah. uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you for... Uh, thank you for saying that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Please proceed. My name is Frank Bifolk. I live in White Bear Lake. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I have a son who is a Bosnian veteran. I have a daughter who is a veteran of two tours in the Middle East. Uh, 
I have a lot of hobbies, and one of them is uh, an interest in firearms. Uh, however, my interest in firearms is uh, uh, purely practical. Uh, my other uh, hobbies, uh, uh, model railroading, take a very large precedent. Uh, we're, all, uh, we're all members of the uh, national militia. By, whether you like it or not, if you're a citizen of the United States, you're in the framers' minds a member of the uh, national militia. And I took an oath as a, uh, as a uh, veteran, uh, as a uh, CB in the United States Navy, to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. I never rescinded that oath, nor did either of my children, and my two other children were uh, sworn to it when they were still young and at my dinner table many, many years ago. Uh, I collect, uh, or I don't collect, I just have acquired some uh, uh, rifles. I guess everybody calls them assault rifles, uh, though they function very much like the uh, uh, the hunting rifles that other people will want to uh, be are worried about having uh, taken away or restricted in some form. Uh, Mr. Reifolk, I will ask you to address your testimony uh, not to assault weapons bans or ammo clip bans, but only well, to the other proposals. Well, it's just that in 458, which I'm addressing, does mention it. That's the only reason, and that's the only the only time I want to uh, I'll bring it up. But I, I I collect, you know, I mean, I acquire military, I have acquired military type or style we weapons because I consider myself, uh, a, a, again, in the militia. And uh, uh, over the period of our, our long history, there have been times when our, our, our freedoms have been, uh, have been uh, uh, tested and been threatened. And this is probably the first time in our life uh, that we're actually uh, facing some a potentially very uh, 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 dangerous and serious uh, 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 enemies. China's rattling their sabers. North. Uh, uh, North Korea is rattling its sabers. The Middle East, most of the Middle East hates us, and now Africa is building up. Uh, we have an unrestricted uh, border where people are pouring over, and so I, I suggest that we have an awful lot of uh, uh, enemies from without, but we also have a lot of enemies from within. And from some of the things that are being spoken or attempted to be done on a federal level, I would say some of those uh, enemies of the republic, not the democracy, the republic, are uh, very much uh, in, 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 in positions of power in this country. Mr. Breifolk, I'm going to thank you for your testimony. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Riley Johnson. Hi, my name is Riley Johnson. I am a computer engineer, and I'm the son of an FBI agent. Uh, we had the gun house, uh, the house hearings over at the, uh, sorry, the hearings over the house two weeks ago. Um, and after three days, I was exhausted. I don't know how you guys do this every week, um, <laughs> but I thank you for it. Um, <laughs> I really can't they say. call this combat pay? <laughs> yeah. What pay? <laughs> Sorry, please continue. I really can't say what I want to say any better than this. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of those governed that when any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. Um, as people of power and public service, uh, that last part might scare you a little. Um, it's supposed to <laughs> for your benefit and for ours. Um, lawmakers should approach the Constitution with humility and great care. So let's solve the problem with due reference to the Constitution you swore an oath to. As of 2012, uh, Minnesota ranks dead last in four-year high school graduation rates for Latinos and Native Americans, <coughs> second to last for blacks. I've had the privilege of mentoring and educating kids in the Phillips neighborhood for three years, and I have to tell you that the institutions that you guys preside over are desperately failing the kids in my neighborhood. When a high schooler can't write a full sentence or add four and negative five, jobs and societies are locked doors to them. Is it not audacity to ask why so many of our children are turning to gangs and violence? If you want to stop violence, education is the answer. And if you're sincere about establishing background checks without gun registration, bring us a bill that accomplishes that. Don't make the mistake of thinking that our generation of patriots lacks, lacks the courage and the conviction of the first generation. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Michelle McLean. My name is Michelle McLean. I'm speaking on Bills 458 and 520, uh, specifically 458. I do not support any aspect of 458 based on the basic 
uh, and lack of definition in the bills, which starts with subsection one, the use of the language military style assault weapon, unless language is added that addresses specific items or features on a gun that makes it a military style, that language is too vague to be enforced and conversely too broad as to include almost all guns as a military uses both rifles and pistols. Specifically, I'm not sure if you're talking about a military uh, assault style of World War II or 2012. Many antiques guns would fall into this category. Section three of that bill, transfer permit, this feels like a backdoor registration attempt and I do not support any registration. I understand the need to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, but the only people to follow this transfer would be law-abiding citizens who will have their guns taken away should the government decide to confiscate guns. I hear all the time that that will never happen. No one wants your guns. They just want to stop the mass shootings. This bill, nor any bill that I've seen, would stop a mass shooting because it wouldn't stop the, the motive behind those shootings and they will find the means to do that. But confiscations have happened in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, and in Germany. And in each case they said, let's just register these guns and we'll never confiscate your guns, but they did in every single case. And in one case we obviously all know it ended in a world war because the citizens of Germany, specifically the, the Jews, had registered and then their guns were confiscated. I am appalled by some of the history that I've heard here tonight. Um, I do have an article that speaks, uh, that outlines the registration that, that happened in Germany and how that registration made confiscation so easy. Once that happened, they knew where all the guns were, they came and took the guns. And who came and helped Germany? We, paid, we played a large part of that. Who's gonna come save us? Who honestly has the power to come save us if should all of our guns be gone? I myself own a gun. I don't look like a gun owner, and I do for that reason. I'm also speaking on Bill 520. It seems this bill may be aimed to assisting individuals who fear they may have, a violent, may have violence to themselves or others and feel they cannot trust themselves in the future and not buying a gun. This bill speaks to um, specifically an individual self-registering in a voluntary registration. But even if their name is on a registry and they decide they cannot uh, stop themselves, that's not gonna stop them from buying a gun from a gang banger or stealing a gun and doing a mass murder. Ms. McLean, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm gonna thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cohen. Uh, Ms. McLean, I've, I've gotta respond. Um, I, Are you responding I, to me, I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, understanding your concern about uh, what may or may have happened with, with gun registration, what, what might have happened in some countries, I, I think your suggestion that what took place in Germany in the 1930s was a consequence of uh, the seizure of guns is, is at best uh, a gross simplification of what the history really was. Um, having read about the histories, uh, in, in a fairly detailed way, but more importantly, having a number of people in my district who are Holocaust survivors who've talked to me about what took place directly with them and their families, I'll suggest that uh, the history is much broader, much deeper, and uh, whatever role guns may or may not have played, it was a very minute part of what took place in Germany. Chairman, I would McLean. strongly disagree with that. Um, I think history does show that although there were many issues going on in Germany, Ultimately, the fact that citizens did not have guns to defend themselves brought the Germans in to mass murder six million Jews. They had no ways to defend themselves. And in specifically Warsaw, there was an uprising because those folks didn't give up their guns. And I, I, would, I would love to have a, a greater debate on the history, but I, I strongly disagree. They have to give up their guns? Well, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make the this comment, but you brought up God Warsaw. Uh, what took place in the Warsaw Ghetto, and, and, and uh, I, I know people who, who are Polish who are survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, the Warsaw Ghetto was basically uh, uh, a suicide attempt. Um, nobody had any illusion that they would be able to defeat the German army outside of the ghetto. Nobody had any illusion of that sort. But yet they fought. 
and were all killed. But yet they fought. Thank you. The next uh, testifiers will be Dean Zimmerly, Jan Antonozzi, and Matt Dosser. Please come on forward. Zimmerly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the committee. My name is Dean Zimmerly. I'm a lifelong resident of Minnesota. I'm a permit to carry holder and a student at Hamlin University School of Law. In the wake of, a, of an incident like Sandy Hook or any other of the mass shootings that happened in 2011, the response is always that we have to do something. Uh, but first I want to address uh, whether we really do need to do something. Uh, in 1995, the United States had about 12,000 murders. In 2011, that was down to 8,500. Uh, in Minnesota, it was 115, down to 43 in 2011. Uh, Minnesota does not have a violent crime problem. You have uh, 1.4 out of 100,000 people are uh, murdered in this state. Uh, so I'm not so sure that we actually have a violent crime problem, a gun problem to address. Uh, and if we do, I think we're already doing a good job. The Brady campaign uh, has that only 13 states have tougher gun laws than Minnesota. Uh, to the bill specifically, uh, Senate File 458, there's an issue where anyone that's hospitalized or confined for a mental illness uh, could have the right to own or purchase a gun taken away. Uh, I think this is a substantially overbroad provision because there's many types of me mental illness where a person could seek inpatient hospital treatment uh, where they actually would not have any violent tendencies. Uh, one example that comes to mind is anorexia bulimia. Uh, somebody could definitely have to go to a hospital to have treatment for that, uh, but they would obviously have no uh, tendencies to be violent. Um, other provisions in the bill, a $25 fee, upping the time that it takes to approve a permit to seven days, uh, addressing federal law instead of just uh, Minnesota specific laws, uh, possible in-person application with up to a 30-day extension. Th these don't do anything to stop Sandy Hook. They don't do anything to stop violence. They do nothing but stop people like me, make it more cumbersome for me to go buy a gun. Uh, and to Senate File 557, uh, it, it adds a provision where a uh, police officer in issuing, in issuing permits to purchase uh, could deny that permit to purchase, or might be permit to carry, excuse me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that, uh, but deny discretion for issuing that permit if they've had uh, too many contacts with the police. I think this gives way too much discretion to law enforcement officers uh, in issuing permits uh, when the right when it is, it, it is a right that we shouldn't have to get uh, permission from the state to do. So I think that, that allowing this extra discretion with Senate File 557, uh, it, it bothers me and I oppose both these bills and, and generally the rest of them that are on uh, the Senate's committee today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerly. Uh, Jan Antonozzi. Hi, thank you for pronouncing that correctly. I'm Jan Antonosi. Doing better I, now. Pardon? I'm doing better now. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Usually the Z's throw people. I'm from Ham Lake. Um, I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. Um, I haven't testified before. I haven't heard all of the testimony, so um, I don't know if I'll be repeating any points you've already heard. Uh, most of the points I was going to make have already been made very eloquently tonight by those of, um, against testifying against. So I just have some bullet points that um, are kind of in response to the testimony I've heard, that you've heard. Um, background checks only will affect the honest people. Obviously the criminals aren't gonna be affected by that one way or another. Guns can cross state lines, so whatever we do in Minnesota, they're gonna come in across the border. The bad guys are always gonna get the guns. Anecdotes don't make good policy. Um, we've heard anecdotes um, and tragic anecdotes that tear at your heartstrings, but we've also heard anecdotes where guns have saved lives, saved crime, you know, prevented crime. Um, I have a friend who he and his wife were walking in a skyway one evening in downtown Minneapolis and they were accosted. He had a permit to carry, he was carrying. 
he didn't have to even draw his gun. He just kind of swept his jacket back, and the guy left. He, he ran away. If he wouldn't have had a gun, who knows what would have happened. Um, there's also the mall shootings and the um, church shootings where somebody has been armed, and they have put a stop to it. So instead of 17 or 25 or 50 deaths, you have two deaths, and somebody takes the guy out because they're armed and they're there. That You don't have to wait for the police to show up. Oh, and by the way, they also called the police. The, they waited 20 minutes. The police never did come to the Skyway. Um, we've talked about polls. Polls can be constructed to get the result you desire. So I really don't trust a lot of polls. Um, we need compelling evidence to restrict citizens' rights. That's fact-based evidence, not feelings or not fears. It seems like there's a lot of fear. A lot of people have a fear of guns or they hate guns. And they're, not, they're basing it on emotion, not on fact. Um, you could incarcerate all the NRA folks or the gun-toting gun folks, and it would not stop the crimes and the murders. More murders are committed with hammers than with handguns. Um, somebody talked about power, that the fact that they had a gun gave them power over another person. Well, so does a crowbar, so does a, tra a baseball bat or a taser. Um, there's millions of gun owners that pose no threat to anybody. Uh, it's not the policeman's job to protect me. It's my job to protect me. Ms. Antonosi, I want to thank you for your okay, testimony. Thank you. Matt, is it Dosser? Dosser, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do oppose uh, Senate uh, 458. And uh, there's a couple quick things I'd like to point out, that since conceal and carry in Minnesota has been passed in 05, there has not been an increase in violent crime. It's actually been down 25% is uh, the best uh, to my ability that I was able to find statistics on it. Uh, also, in 39 of the 49 states that have shell issue, uh, violent crime has gone down substantially. Um, I myself have uh, a lot of contact with the ATF because I am an NFA collector, which means I have to go through a rather rigorous process to attain some of the items that I want to have. And um, one of the things that um, I found interesting in my conversations was that for every 50 to 100 cases that they get a felon in possession of a firearm, they might convict one or two, and the reason they don't go after it is because they're too small, and as one agent put it to me uh, so politely was that it won't make a career case. So I think the issue that we're seeing here is more about enforcement of laws rather than creating new laws, and in this particular case, a de facto tax on uh, our poor uh, neighbors and friends in Minnesota that might not be able to afford to have that uh, when, they're, when they're, you know, it's just a simple matter of like me giving my brother a firearm, for instance. Or even a graver concern is uh, <clears throat> women that are uh, victims of domestic violence. Because I know from personal experience, I had a friend of mine that had to attain a restraining order against the gentleman who was threatening to kill her. Now, she had been deathly afraid of firearms, but I took her aside and I brought her to the range, got her comfortable, and I handed her the firearm until she felt comfortable again and the threats were ceased. What this bill would do is it would cause her to wait a week at minimum, which is, I believe, the current wait time. It's like a week to 10 days to just get your permit to purchase. Then she would have to pay a fee in order to attain that firearm. And in that time frame, who knows what could happen? She already had a restraining order, and as most of us are aware, the police are not there at all times. It usually takes, at best, two minutes if they're in your neighborhood, which is more than enough time for an uh, individual that's intent on homicide or great bodily harm to commit their acts before the police can even arrive. So I, I just, there's a lot of other flaws in this bill that I don't think we have a lot of time for, but my biggest concern is that this bill is just penalizing all of us. It isn't going to stop crime. It's just another law that won't get enforced because how can you prove that I sold this firearm after this bill went into effect with a gun that was bought five years ago? Then you're talking about registration. And yes, there has been confiscation in the United States with registration. It happened in Louisiana. They went door to door and seized firearms from people. There's a video on the internet of ATF agents picking a 68-year-old woman up off the ground and slamming her on the ground for having her own firearm. Mr. Dosser, I'm going to thank you for your testimony, sir. All right, the next uh, three who have signed up is uh, Brian Strausser, Daniel Passer, and Sean Alter. Please come on forward, and after that will be Michael Fiacco. Uh, Mr. Strausser? Yes, good evening. Go ahead, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. 
My name is Brian Strausser. I live in Woodbury, Minnesota. I'm an NRA instructor, a Minnesota permit to carry instructor, and a member of the board of directors of the Oakdale Gun Club. Like many others today, I'm here on my own time, and I'm going to be here tomorrow as well. I'm here to testify in opposition to Senate File 458, and given the time constraints, I'll just make a few simple points. First, there's been a number of references to the number of private sales or private firearms transactions as the basis for this change, that 40 percent of private firearms sales um, happen, through, happen outside of the background check system. That number is based on a 20-year-old study of only 251 transactions that were analyzed. In fact, the Washington Post, definitely not an opponent of most gun control <clears throat> in their editorial pages, described this figure, the use of this figure in January as deserving of two Pinocchios for its level of falsehoods. Second, we know that criminals are not going to follow this type of law, and we've heard examples of that this evening. They're going to continue to market in firearms illegally. Third, this bill calls for a permit to purchase fee of $25, where today that is free. <clears throat> and it requires a firearms transfer to happen through a dealer who may charge a fee up to $25 as well. So this is making it more expensive for a law-abiding citizen to follow the law and own a firearm. We know from the U.S. government's own National Institute of Justice, who said in the January 2013 memo to the Vice President's Task Force on Gun Violence that universal background checks will not be effective unless they are coupled with mandatory firearms registration, a firearms surveillance program, and a crackdown on straw purchasers. We've heard a number of references this evening and earlier today to the tragedies in Sandy Hook and Aurora and other mass shootings, and there is nothing in this bill that would have stopped or impacted any of those situations. I would agree there are challenges with the background check system federally and here in Minnesota. I would say that we should focus on getting the right records into the, law, into the system and start prosecuting the criminals that violate the existing laws that we have on the books, both federally and here in the state. The right place for those sorts of criminals, despite what we've heard from others tonight, is behind bars. I strongly reject the notion, as many here do and will say later today, that the actions of criminals are in any way, shape, or form the fault of law-abiding citizens or law-abiding gun owners. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Daniel Passer. Not here. Sean Alter. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chairman. My name's Sean Alter. I'm from Bloomington, Minnesota. I just want to say real quick, I've been a, a Democrat my whole life. I like um, a lot of the environmental stuff you guys do. I, I really think that there's a lot of cases where you can just pass a law and it stops poisons from being in our child's toys just like that. I don't think that universal backgrounds checks is that simple. Uh, Senator Latz, I heard you on the radio uh, this morning and, and I think you used a metaphor if, if I heard you correctly saying that. Uh, we've got this damn 60% completed, meaning that we have a lot of universal background checks in place. Um, we've already got this 60% completed, this damn 60% completed, and it would make sense to go the rest of the way. I, I don't think that that's a correct analogy. I think the analogy is more of a network than a dam. Um, people have already said today that if you, if you do want a gun and you're a criminal, you can get one. Um, it's not that hard. Uh, I work at a gun shop. I've conducted hundreds and hundreds of these background checks. Every single time, these people are preceded. Um, they might be delayed for a few days. They've got to leave. And then, then they have to come back, and then eventually we proceed them. Um, and if it's an inconvenience, fine. If it actually works and it saves people's lives, I don't like sitting here and listening to victim after victim of gun violence come up and testify and say how, how their brother and their friends and, and, and their loved ones were killed. I don't, I'm not in support of that. None of us are. But just because I'm against this bill and I'm, I, I think that guns are a neutral tool and that as we've looked at the numbers today with concealed carry, for example, they do protect people. Um, I've done a lot of research on this. I can't find any hard, fast rules in either direction, but uh, the numbers that I've seen for uh, defensive use, it ranges from 500,000 defensive uses of handguns to 2.5 million. And most of those are just cases where people are ready, they present the firearm, and that's it. No shots fired, nothing has happened. Um, the cases where that didn't happen and people are victims. I can't even say anything about that. It's horrible. It's horrible and I wish it didn't happen. I wish somebody was there to protect them. I wish some of the people that are in this room right now could have protected them. Sadly, they weren't. Um, 
but to make the majority, the vast, vast, vast majority, the 99.9% .9 of us submit ourselves for, in my shop, it's $50 for a transfer fee, and well, it's 50 bucks, wh whatever that means to you, but it's still $50. Um, if a grandfather wants to hand down a firearm to his son or his grandson, uh, $50, and then you've got to drive there. It's just, if it would prevent something, any violence at all, I would be, I would be testifying right now in support of it. In all my experience, and all my, my years in the industry, I really don't see how it's going to do anything, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alter. All right, uh, Michael Fiacco. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, I don't have anything uh, as prepared as, as these other folks. I'm just going to cut to the chase. This is a money grab because you're broke. We're broke. And it's revenue generation and you're aiming at a market that you know you can tap. And I just want to go on record, make sure everybody's on record here knowing that. This is a money grab. I wish it were about keep, keeping people safe. I wish it were about all of these wonderful motives that they should be about, but I just know they aren't. I, I just know that, that that's not what's behind this. Uh, it is a revenue grab. And the idea of universal background checks, it sounds great, but it's going to wind up a registry. And the government will eventually, I'm not sure when, you're going to come for the guns. And then it's on. Um, government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. And like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And we'll give that one to George Washington. You're going to create a bureaucratic nightmare. You're going to badger us into paying these poll taxes in order to do what we just normally do as law-abiding gun owners. And I'm not afraid to say law-abiding. We are law-abiding people. And enough is enough. I'll use that one as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we don't have anyone else on the, uh, the pre-signed witness list. Uh, what I'm going to do now is, uh, uh, because of the time, I'm going to see if there's anyone else in the room that um, has not yet had an opportunity to testify that would like to add to the, uh, the testimonial record here. Um, if there are, are you welcome to uh, come on forward. We'll give you the same two and a half minutes that we've given uh, to those others who had pre-signed up. Come on forward, just grab a seat and uh, give us your name, please. Make sure you sign in on the sheet and uh, print clearly, since we'll only have this one record of your name uh, for the public record. Uh, Ma'am, why don't you go ahead and start, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Leslie Henschel. I live in Apple Valley, Minnesota. I'm the proud wife of a veteran of 34 years. Every time he re-enlisted, he took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. I assume each of you did also. Amendment 2 says a well-regulated militia, that's the people, being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people, not the privilege, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And I thought, what exactly does infringed mean? So I got out Noah Webster and went through it. It means to trespass upon. Now I assume most of you are homeowners. If somebody kept tr trespassing across your yard, it would erode. I see what you're doing as eroding my rights, my responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Henschel. Sir, go ahead and state your name for the record, please. My name is Lee Valley. I'm from Chanhassen, Minnesota. And thank you for letting me be here. I want to briefly uh, say that none of us that are against this law, I'm speaking against uh, the proposal. 
But none of us are insensitive to what goes on, the crime that goes on, the violence that goes on. What we'd like to have is a logical discussion, a logical debate as to what really works. So if we want to accomplish something, we need to look at what really does work. So I'm obviously not an expert witness, but I've done my own investigation to find out in reading, to find out what does work and what doesn't work. And I'd encourage you to get the book from John Lott, which is a very scholarly work, which uses a lot of, of data, probably the broadest amount of data of any of the studies. The book is uh, More Guns and Less Crime. And there's three things that he says and has debated around the United States that works. One is the ability for law-abiding citizens to carry weapons, number one. Number two is the uh, arrest rate. So when enforcement is present, that also reduces crime. And number three, it's the conviction rate. Surprisingly enough, the, the sentencing has very little to do with impact on crime, but those three things have a significant impact on crime. Number one, again, is the ability for law-abiding citizens to carry weapons. So if we take away the ability for law-abiding citizens to carry weapons or make it very difficult for them, which has the net result of reducing the number of guns in the hands of law-abiding citizens, then we have the net effect of increasing crime. And it is actually demonstrable from the statistics. So uh, my, my uh, speaking is against the bill, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And make sure that you sign in and, and hand to Ms. Henschel as well. Thank you. <laughs> sir, go ahead. Hi, my name is Fred Gersio. I live in Burnsville, Minnesota. I've been in Minnesota since the early 80s. I've been here a long time. Um, I want to cover some uh, statistical information on crimes and gun, and then I want to tell a little history lesson. Um, everybody should in here, and matter of fact, I've emailed a large majority of you crime stats from the FBI crime tables. FBI crime tables 1, 8, and 24 show that from 1992 to, 19, to 2011, which were released in 2012, that's 1992 to 2011, crime has reduced in every category that they have across the board. Those stats are available per city, per state and per county. And they're all down. The only places they're not down are the places that have no pistol permits and 100% gun registration. I'm a, I grew up in New York State. My pistol permit is not valid for New York City. New York City has had 100% gun registration since, since the mid-70s. They have the highest crime rates in the country just about. That whole corridor, New York City, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and Maryland had tough gun laws, no pistol permits, registration. That was the mantra. They have a lot of people there. It didn't work. Virginia went against the trend, started issuing thou shalt issue pistol permits. That's a very important phrase, thou shalt issue. Their crime plummeted. You look at their state highway signs and say, welcome to Virginia. We're armed. We don't allow crime. Those statistics are extremely important, and we break down by weapon. 323 murders, homicides, by rifle in 2011. There were 4,000 by knives, feet, hands, and clubs. 4,000. Now, the assault rifle is part of, it's just a semi-automatic rifle. It's part of that 323. What they don't tell you in the FBI crime tables, that the police shootings and the legal citizen shootings are also buried in those numbers. I haven't been able to find the non-legal. In other words, there are castle doctrines where you're allowed to protect what we didn't pass last summer. You're allowed to protect yourself and your home. Minnesota wants us to flee our home. Tough to do when it's minus 10. Slippers, bathrobe, no gun. Those statistics are overwhelming. And not only the, the, the non the non-legal shootings, the ones where they don't have a castle doctrine, or the ones they shot outside the house. Those numbers are included in there too. And I think they're going to be about 1,000 to 1,500 a year, but I haven't found them. That's a 33% increase in those legal shootings up to that 8,500. It's a large number. Sir, I'm going to so thank you. I'm going to thank you for your testimony. Can I do one more thing? That's been two and a half minutes. I'm sorry. World Health Hold, Organization. I'm holding everyone to the same. Element. But just, just for the record, we do have a castle doctrine in Minnesota. Uh, the proposal was to expand that, um, but that's uh, a, they diff a different uh, topic for a different day. I, I called a, um, a, a, a gentleman that teaches for my gun club to conceal and carry class, and they said we're supposed to flee our home. There is no castle doctrine.
Uh, I guess it depends on his definition of the castle doctrine, sir. Uh, he pretty much told us you're to flee your home, and if you discharge your weapon, have a lawyer on file because you'll probably be arrested. Sir, you are. Uh, the doctrine is you are to flee your home if you can do so safely, um, and if that's the most reasonable course of action to take. But you have a right to stand your ground within your own home if that's what it takes to protect yourself and your family. Um, but let's leave that uh, that discussion for another day. Um, is there anyone else um, Thank you. who uh, would like to uh, come forward? Yes, ma'am, please. And come on forward, uh, those of you who wish. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, sir. You sat down first. Go ahead. Uh, and uh, again, please sign in legibly and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, committee. Uh, my name is Mark Lyon. Uh, I'm from Andover. <clears throat> uh, I apologize. I am a little bit nervous. I wasn't prepared to do this, but uh, I felt compelled. Um, I am currently a law enforcement student. Uh, I hope to be an officer in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I'm also an Army veteran with six years active, reserve, and guard. Um, my goal in life is always to help other people, to protect them, and to protect myself in any way that I can, and in any way that is necessary. Um, I feel that these laws, especially uh, 458, which I oppose, um, are, like uh, the woman said before, eroding at our rights to protect ourselves. Um, I don't have a whole lot more that I want to say that I have any factual basis for that I want to compel you with numbers or anything like that. Uh, again, I apologize. I, I just wasn't prepared to do this. Um, but what I do want to say, I do want to share two things with you. Uh, one is a maximum, one is a quote. The maxim is that when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. And I urge you to remember that we just want to protect ourselves. And all you're doing with this is taking the rights of the people to protect themselves away. Criminals don't care. They don't care. They never will. And the second thing that I want to say, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is a quote from Admiral Yamamoto of the Imperial Japanese Fleet. He once said that the mainland United States could never be invaded because there would be a rifle behind every blade of grass. What that tells us is that the people of this country defend this country. Internally, externally, whatever it takes, we defend it. Thank you, and uh, I'll yield whatever time I have left to anyone else. Thank you, sir. Sir, go ahead, please uh, state sure. your name for the record. <clears throat> My name is Donald Pearson. I'm a former United States Marine. I'm a Vietnam uh, combat veteran. I'm a 100% disability uh, vet. I'm a range safety officer. I'm a DNR officer, and I'm licensed to carry a gun. Uh, what I would like to address this about is two things. One, uh, you're saying that by registering the guns, it will make a difference, all right? I have a quote here, actual uh, statistics. It basically is, why is it progressive liberals that steal guns, then go and kill moviegoers and children in scheduled schools have never been an NRA member? Ford Hood, registered Democrat, Muslim. Columbia, too young to vote. Both families were registered Democrats and progressive liberals. Virginia Tech wrote hate uh, mail to the President Bush, to his staff, registered Democrat. Colorado Theater, registered Democrat, staff worker on Obama's campaign, occupied, occupied, uh, sorry, Occupy Wall Street participant, progressive liberal. Connecticut school shooter, registered Democrat, hated Christians. Common thread is that of all these shooters, they're progressive liberal Democrats. That is, seems to be a problem. Another thing. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm going to ask you to focus your testimony here's, on the particular that are the bills that are before this committee okay. for consideration. And please refrain from any negative references with regard to religion, sir. Okay. With, con with gun control being pushed by 
the left on uh, both state and federal levels. There's a requirement to invade privileged information on all servicemen and veterans. The feds will require all doctors, psychologists, shrinks, and many other, uh, and anyone else that, that gives any confidential patient information or records that then these will be put on a national health record that all states will have access to. All veterans that have been wounded, hurt, disabled, or treated, their medical records will be checked to see if they have had drugs, any type of narcotics, antidepressant, or any mild mind or body altering drugs sir, I'm given to them by VA. I'm gonna thank you for your testimony. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this time. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Jill Crouch. I'm from Minnetonka, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak. And I'm just really so, just so happy to see so many people here that are here to speak for freedom. It just makes me feel good to, to see this. So I'm glad I came um, again. Um, and I'm also very glad that our forefathers were armed or we wouldn't have this right to this assembly. We wouldn't have the form of Republican government that we have now had they not been armed. I find it actually appalling that the state of Minnesota, that legislators are considering legislation that is unconstitutional. This shouldn't have gotten this far. It should never have been considered. This violates our constitutional rights. And this effort to do something is it's gonna be ineffective. The only thing it will do is further limit our rights as uh, permit holders and gun owners. The other thing that I think it's, um, I would not trust that a state or a federal institution is gonna effectively manage these records and keep them private and do a good job if they did do further background checks. Usually government doesn't operate as, as effectively as a business does. And um, I think it's just very important for us each to speak because uh, evil prevails when good people do nothing. And I, this is a time that we need to speak and I appreciate that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Not sure if I should ask Senator Goodwin to give us her list of private businesses who have experienced major data security breaches in the last year. We have heard that already at a committee hearing earlier this year, and I can guarantee you it rivals any government data security issues. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I'm not just talking about data breaches, I'm just talking about inefficiency. Oh. Inefficiencies is a subject for another conversation. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, let's not forget the DNR breaches recently as well. Uh, sir, let, and you may and you Thank have. You. Thank you, sir. Um, we can just look in today's paper, the breaches at Google and, and uh, New York Times um, and all these major corporations that have incredibly sensitive data who have large ag agencies and private companies supposedly protecting their data that have been hacked and breached by high schoolers and, and, uh, <laughs> and many others. Uh, so I don't think... There's any monopoly on data security, uh, ma'am. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Go My ahead name. And please sign in and state your name for okay. the record as well. My name is Patricia Boyd, and I am Senator Cohen's one of his constituents. I live in Highland Park, and I've been very concerned. I was at the hearings a couple weeks ago in the House and came tonight. I am a military mother, I'm a double blue star mother. My father was a police officer. I grew up with loaded guns in my house all the time. I actually rode on buses with the ROTC kids who carried their rifles to school once a week on the bus. Yeah, we didn't have mass murders then. And uh, I've actually had two meetings in my home. Well, one was in my home, but it outgrew my home. And I had to uh, rent a room at the Highland Ice Arena. 
And I was encouraging women to get a permit to carry women and seniors, which I'm, I'm both, and because I hate to see women be victims when they don't have to be. And I encouraged them to take gun classes and get a permit to carry. I was the victim of domestic violence. Have you ever had someone threaten to kill you this far from your face and know that they would if they had the chance? And from that time on, I never, until I could get this man out of my house, my ex-husband, I carried a loaded gun with me every time I went in my house because that's what I had to do, to, what I felt I had to do to survive. And I encourage women to not have to be victims. And um, so all of these gun restrictions really concern me. And I'll have to um, say that I have to quote one of the other speakers that quoted Patrick Henry when he said, I smell a rat and I smell a big rat here. Um, and the reason I do is think logically and not with emotion that after Sandy Hook, it was all about gun control. We've got to do something. But strangely silent all last summer when the massacres in Chicago were going on every um, weekend. And why wasn't gun control talked about then? Because it didn't fit the liberal narrative because Chicago has strict gun tr control, but look what's going on in the streets there. And so you know that that does not work. So I just wanted to come down here and express those um, opinions of mine. And I will be watching you, Senator Cohen, and how you vote, because you're my <laughs> senator. And I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Is there anyone else uh, who wishes to add to the testimony? tonight. Uh, come on forward. Uh, while, while you're coming forward, I'm going to note that uh, all of us here at the table uh, are, in, I think, can agree that we would like to see gun violence reduced. And I don't think there's anyone in this room that has a monopoly on that claim. And I think uh, while we may approach the solutions to that problem um, in different ways, uh, that we are attempting to do so out of good faith and sincere efforts. And I ask that the uh, witnesses respect that among all of those that are in this room. Uh, thank you. Uh, sir, to my right, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. State Chairman. your full name. And, and uh, my name is John Mulfort, and I come here as a grandfather and a father. And I'm here in opposition to Bill uh, 458 because even the ostensibly benign uh, background check system uh, that's proposed could possibly lead to a paper trail, which would also possibly lead to registration. Why are gun owners so opposed to registration? Well, here in this country, registration in 1991 by Mayor Dinkins in New York City led to confiscation a year later of the very weapons that he registered. And that's the concern that we have about even this benign system that could set up a paper trail. Um, also, uh, the same kind of procedure happened in California with SKSs. Uh, why are we opposed to registration? Because it could co possibly lead to confiscation. Why are we opposed to confiscation? Well, every single genocide that occurred in the 20th century, every single one, 50 million people, died after their firearms were first seized. That's why we're opposed to registration and confiscation. We don't want the balance of power to be in the hands of government uh, as, as opposed to we, the people, having a fair balance. Um, I would remind respectfully the committee that when they say those kind of genocides can't happen here, that in the election of George Bush Sr. in the primaries of Louisiana, a racist uh, member of the KKK and Nazi party, uh, David Duke, garnered 40% of the vote against President Bush. So to say that it can't happen here also denies other abuses of government that have occurred throughout history. For example, the internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. These are abuses of government in the past that we do not, we want to protect ourselves with by having the balance of power with our firearms. Those are the only protections we really have. How about just in December of this last year, we remember, remember the massacre of, at Wounded Knee when 150 to 300 Sioux were turning in their rifles peacefully and then were massacred subsequent to that. How about Kent State? 
and I could name a number of other abuses by government, why gun owners do not want to have their firearms confiscated. They want, I want to protect my children and grandchildren from something that will be in perpetuity if this is enacted, this possibility of registration and confiscation. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. And I will only note that there seems that there were a, a variety of partisan political affiliations in charge of government at the times that some of those that's uh, correct, occurred. Mr. So Chairman. I don't know Matter of fact, those abuses have occurred during both Democrat and Republican so, administrations. So, so it is not pointing necessarily at, you know, liberal. Th that was my point, sir. Thank yes, sir. You. Thank you, uh, sir. Go ahead. In the middle. Hi there. My name is William Meese IV, and uh, I heard a lot of stuff today. I just wanted to touch on some things. Um, oh. I think one lady had mentioned uh, arms list and a lot of private transactions. If you actually look closely at those. Uh, we as gun owners regulate ourselves pretty heavily. You'll notice a lot of those ads actually requ require a permit to purchase or some type of permit. I think that if you give us the tools, uh, we will do it ourselves. Uh, give, us, give us the access to the NICS system ourselves to call it in. Um, you know, give us the tools. Don't charge us money. It, quit making it more difficult. We'd, we we want to keep the guns away from the bad people just as much as the anti-gun people. So. Uh, I think give us some tools, uh, common sense things, um, and we'll do the right thing. Um, just just make it simpler and less hurdles. Um, a little nervous here. <laughs> I'm not prepared. I just you know like I heard a lot of good stuff today. I admire all the passion out here, and um, just just give us some tools and use some common sense on this. And what's all the stuff with registration? You know, I mean, why do we need to register them if we're you know, is he legal to own a gun or not? That's all we need to know. Why do you need a serial number? You know, why do you need any of that stuff? Just, it's really clear cut and, and to me, it's just really common sense is all it's gonna take, so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Did very, very well for being so nervous. <laughs> Make Hello. sure you sign in on the, on the sheet there too, please. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Hello, my name is Dustin Helton. I live in Hastings, Minnesota. Um, I oppose both the bills that are being discussed this evening because it would prevent me from passing down the very first shotgun that was passed down to me by my father to my nephew without some kind of fees or transfers. It would also allow me, or it would also prevent me from allowing my father to take one of my rifles hunting up north for the weekend as I hunt down in the South Metro. Now, with a 12 hour limit, that makes it pretty difficult for him to go all the way up by Bemidji and come back in time within that time frame. That would put in, invoke multiple transfers on both myself and my father to do so. Um, this is the main re one of the main reasons I'm against that bill. I, I strongly believe that we should be spending more time on focusing to enforce the current laws we have. In a USA Today study in 2010, it showed Minnesota was the 12th highest tax state in the nation, and yet we are still hurting for money. I believe there's some problems that are invoked along those lines. Now, I believe that we should be focusing on giving more money to law enforcement agencies, and I continue to hear that their funding keeps being cut. Well, how are they supposed to enforce the current laws we have to get the illegal guns off the street if you continue to cut their funding? It makes it very difficult for anyone even yourselves when your funding's cut to do your jobs. So I think we need to focus strongly on getting the correct law enforcement, the funds they need to, to currently enforce the laws to get these guns off the street. That would make a real difference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just so the, uh, the record is clear, I should note that the 12-hour uh, the, the limit that you referred to in current law and in the proposed legislation does not apply to long guns. Uh, just so that the I, I understand that, sir. That but if my father was using what was deemed as a assault rifle in your guys's proposed or in the proposed bills, that would allow him prevent him from doing so. Okay. Um, as, as far as uh, we are aware, there are no proposals to change the law with regard to assault weapons in that regard, sir. All right. Thank uh, you. And. Uh, uh, for the record, I think all of us up here would probably agree if the goal were to raise revenue, there are a lot easier ways to do it than well, to go not, through this process. I'm not process. stating that. So, I, I did not make that statement. I know, but you made reference to it, and, and uh, some others have, have alluded to it as well. 
Um, and uh, I think we also might find consensus that uh, it'd be good if we could find a way to make sure that our law enforcement agencies are more fully funded. Um, but that, that's a much bigger discussion. All right, uh, any other individuals wish to uh, testify? Look around. Uh, 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 since, since there's no one else who wishes to, t I'm, I'm not going to reopen up the table to everyone who's already had their two and a half minutes. Um, I, I remember, sir, that you were a little bit, uh, sure, I give you 15 seconds, that's all you're getting, because I'm not going to reopen the entire hearing again, sir. All right. My name is Curtis Anderson. Uh, two things. At the gun shop the other day, I saw uh, an assault looking weapon that shoots a 410 shotgun shell. So I was shocked myself when I saw it. Um, so that would be banned under this because it shoots a shotgun shell, yet it looks like an assault rifle. It has there is no assault weapon proposal and there's no ban on no, any weapons. No, I'm talking as far as the background check. There are no Mr. bans Chair. proposed in any of these legislations. It, it, whether a background check would apply, uh, that would apply to all firearms. Sales. Correct. Okay. And then the, to speak on the inconvenience of uh, the fee, I remember back when uh, voter registration was being brought before the Senate that uh, that it was mocked that or it was not mocked, but it was brought up that uh, $45 to buy a, a birth certificate, a one-time purchase of a birth certificate, was too much financial burden on uh, a resident of the state of Minnesota in order to be uh, registered as a voter. Um, that was a one-time purchase, maybe if you lose it every couple of years, but at the same time, if I want to go and drop my weapon off at my sister's house, I, if I leave my home to go to drill for the weekend, I want my weapon to be All right, used. sir. I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt you. All this right. is already well Thank beyond the, the limited opportunity I gave you, you. Uh, to reapproach. And I want to be fair uh, to everyone um, that is here. And, and I'm not going to get into a comparison between the fundamental right to vote and those who assert the uh, fundamental right to possess guns that they feel may be infringed upon by a background check. Senator Orban. Mr. Chair, may, may I ask a question with regard to your intent? Um, you have said that folks could not testify one way or the other on, a, on an assault weapons ban or restrictions on magazine clips. Are you also then saying that you're not going to move any bills like that forward so folks here will understand that that's off the table in the Senate and that's not going to move forward at all this session? Uh, Senator Ortman, I, I made that statement uh, publicly on the Monday of this week, and I've reaffirmed it several times since then, and that is correct. Mr. Chair, I appreciate the clarification tonight. All right. I think everyone who has wanted to have an opportunity to present testimony has had that opportunity and done so. Um, I thank you all for your attendance and uh, your testimony on the public record here tonight. Um, and with, um, I'm going to have. Uh, just one announcement. We are going to uh, continue this hearing tomorrow, promptly starting at noon. We will hear Senate Files 503, 557, 520, 413, and 568. It may last until 6 p.m., but we could be done as early as 4 p.m. I'm not staying. Uh, oh, and, and uh, Senate File 339 um, as well. Uh, okay. uh, so at this time, the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee is adjourned.